My name is Sergeant Christopher Sean Goldsmith, and what I'm here to talk to you about today is prisoners of war. And these are prisoners that most of America does not know about. I'd like to say the following names. Staff Sergeant Keith Matthew Mopin, Specialist Alex Jimenez, and Private Byron Fowdy. Those are who the, the DOD has listed on their website as the confirmed captured prisoners of war. What the DOD does not list on their website is the countless names of soldiers and Marines and other service members who are victims of what they call stop loss. Stop loss was enacted by Congress to be used by the military in a time of war, a time of national emergency to ensure the combat readiness of the military. And the, uh, the really broad description of this war on terror allows the military to keep people like myself and my friends, veterans who have been there once, twice, been there five times, been there three years or 32 years. It allows the military to breach that contract and hold them in until the military sees fit to let them go. I'm here to tell you about my experience with stop loss and the military, how the Army let me down. This is a picture here of me when I was about 10 years old, wearing all camo, having a pair of dog tags, and giving my Boy Scout salute. That boy died in Iraq. This is the proud soldier who enlisted just after Christmas in 2003 to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That boy is dead. I'm from Belmore, a town in Long Island, New York, 20 minutes out of Manhattan. I could see the smoke when the towers fell on September 11th. On September 12th, I remember standing up in a pizza restaurant and telling everyone about how I wanted to kill everyone in the Middle East, how the Middle East should be turned into a glass plate by nuclear weapons, because that's what I believed. That's what the media had trained me to believe. The media had created, had created a racism inside of me that was unjust. I joined the Army to kill people. I signed up as a forward observer, one of the most dangerous, powerful jobs in the military. My job was to go out and basically annihilate the enemy when we received contact. I was in control. I was authorized to use mortars, artillery. That's what I, that's what I was trained for. MLRS, multiple launch rocket systems, capable of destroying a uh, grid square, which is 1,000 meters by 1,000 meters. A lot bigger than the city block. I was 19 years old when I was deployed to Iraq. And I spent the first eight months in Sadr City, which is uh, what everybody who has been in Baghdad considers the slums of Iraq. It's a place that has been neglected not only by Saddam Hussein, but is horribly neglected by America right now. The people there hate us. And the reason why is because when we went there, we promised them freedom and we promised them help. We promised to get them clean water, to get them food, to get them jobs. But all that I saw over there now, uh, all that I saw over there in 2005 and all that there is now is two to four uh, hours of electricity a day, randomly. Sewage that leaks into their fresh water system, if you want to call it fresh. 
the water treatment plant, which hasn't been finished. It was barely even worked on the entire year that I was set in Iraq. I never personally saw any contractors of any country working on that water treatment plant outside Sadr City in 2005. We discovered it. My battalion discovered it and reported up, and we were told to ignore the fact that, that nothing was going on there. It was a... Uh, it was a sector between companies, between battalions, between brigades, and it wasn't within our area of operation, so don't be concerned with what goes on there. After going to Iraq, I quickly learned that it wasn't at all like I thought it was going to be. The people of Iraq were not grateful for us liberating them. They were angry because we were oppressing them. We gave them a curfew and told them that if they came out at night, they'd be arrested, sometimes physically abused. They were often harassed. And these would be people who were driving their pregnant wife to the hospital. They'd be rushing them to the hospital, and we would stop them and search their car, regardless of the fact that their wife was in labor. That happened on multiple occasions. That wasn't a one-time occurrence. That wasn't just my platoon. That wasn't just my company. That was my entire battalion all throughout Sadr City, and I'm sure it happened throughout the rest of Iraq. Imagine living in a place where it gets up to 150 degrees. You don't want to go out during the day. You want to stay in the shade. And at night, American soldiers are roaming, rolling around your streets telling you that you can't go outside and you can't talk to your friends, you can't enjoy yourself. You can't gather outside the coffee house or the chai shop because if you go out past dark, you're committing a crime. So essentially, during the summer months, Sadr City was a prison. 3.2 million people in Sadr City were prisoners of war. I graduated basic training at the top of my class. I graduated Warriors Leaders course, which is uh, the new platoon leadership development course, an NCO course, non-commissioned officers of course, with a 94% grade point average. I was on the Commandant's list. I received a memor uh, memoration of commendation from uh, MIDI, uh, Command, Command Sergeant Major Commandant Committee, uh, excuse me, Mitty A. Smith for um, scoring a 315 in my physical fitness test. I was a great soldier once upon a time, and now I stand here to fight for my brothers more than I ever could while I wore a uniform. I'd like you to play the first video, please. What you see here is civilian Iraqis exhuming the bodies of murdered and tortured Iraqis. We don't know why they were killed. We weren't really trying very hard to find out. We found over a dozen bodies that day. And my job, because we were an authorized artillery, became the intel reporter. So I was forced to take pictures of these dead bodies. I was told for the sake of identity, so that we could try to identify them. But there was no identification process. I never went around with those pictures printed up to the police stations to post them and see if we could find out who they were. You'll see me in a couple seconds standing, uh, standing with another soldier who's on top of the pickup truck, lip right there, lifting up the faces of the Iraqi bodies to take pictures of them. All these pictures were taken for is trophies of war for people who didn't have to experience that death. People made videos to send home to, to their friends and family, to brag, to say this is what happens to Iraqis and this is, this is what the war looks like and it's cool. When people ask me, you can start going through the, uh, the next bunch of uh, pictures. 
When people ask me, hey man, you want to go see Saw 4 or whatever's out? 